Thank you very much. It's a, a true pleasure to be here and uh, share some of the joy of science. Uh, so constructing an Earth, just add water, but I also would like to say we need to add some carbon and some nitrogen and some other things as well. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But first, I, I, want, I love this picture. It's from the European Space Agency. Uh, and it shows the, the various aspects of the Earth. We have a living planet. And you are aware of, you know, the life that we see around us and the life that's on the surface in our cities or in the farms or when you're out in the mountains. And of course, there's life in the water. Uh, and that's what you think of, of life. But the planet is alive as well. The planet has heat in its interior. That heat gets transported to the surface. We have earthquakes. We have volcanoes. That's because we have a living planet. And the, one of the reasons why life is here is because we have a planet that is alive. And I want to try and tie that all together uh, within the context of whether we are alone in the universe. You know, where did life come from? Is it preordained? Are we alone? These are all really fundamental questions. And I have that really nice quote uh, there from Calvin and Hobbes. Sometimes I think the surest sign that intelligent life exists elsewhere in the universe is that none of it has tried to contact us. We could spend a lot of time on why that is, and I'm just going to let you ruminate on that uh, on your own. Um, OK, so the big questions. What are the answers? I don't have a clue. All right, I really, I'm not going to give you the answer to life here. Uh, but, 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 uh, since 1992, we've had a revolution in astronomy. We are detecting planets around other stars. We have not found the true Earth analog yet. All right, but we're on the hunt. And we have found things that we didn't expect. Gas giants, Jupiter's parked right next to the star. In our solar system, Jupiter's in the boonies, the hinterlands of the solar system. And we'll find out that that's kind of important for us. Uh, but there's other systems that are completely different. There's a new class of planets that we didn't even know about called super-Earths. Are these capable of fostering life? We don't know, but we're going to find out. Um, we are also beginning to characterize the beginnings of planetary systems and try to understand the most likely range of outcomes. Is a life, the formation of a living planet that has life on it preordained as part of the formation process? And within the next 10 years, we are going to begin the search for life and see if we are alone in the universe. We've been listening for ET for a while now. No contact. Uh, but now we're actually going to be start looking for evidence of life on other planets. I'm going to focus on the bottom two here, mostly on uh, the, the we are observing planetary systems in formation. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit, very briefly, about the techniques we're going to be using to search for life elsewhere. OK, so if you want to think about life, you know, one perspective is trying to understand how you get from some sort of abiotic chemistry to biological chemistry. That's not me. I don't know anything about that. That's for biochemistry, all right? What are the conditions that foster life? And can we look for those conditions and understand their context within the realm of planet formation? OK? So most broadly, what are these conditions? We have to form a terrestrial planet, a rocky planet like our own, with the stuff of life on it. And we'll have to talk about what that is, all right? It has to be a planet at the right distance from the star. OK, I'll explain that. Uh, and it has to have a stable climate. It has to be alive. OK, so planet formation and the elements of life. So neat little thing. All life on Earth uses water as the liquid medium for the chemistry of life. All life on Earth uses one molecule, adenosine triphosphate, as the battery to store energy in the cell. 
all life on Earth uses one molecule, deoxyribose nucleic acid, to pass on heredity, or as I call it, chemistry with memory. Wow. Right? Wow. So what does that mean? Well, it's very simple. It points to a single common origin of life. All right? So what can, what can foster this? And I'm going to go just from the, the basic, trying to do things in the broadest sense that I can, because actually it's all I could do as an astronomer, uh, and focus on can we get the right elements, and perhaps can we understand what are the right amounts. And, and we know what the right elements are. We don't know the right amounts. So here's the human body. So this is a good context to understand what the right elements are. Well, we are mostly made of water. All right. So oxygen is 65% of our body by math. All right, well, carbon is the, the chemistry, it fosters the chemistry of life, clearly, crucially important, as is nitrogen. The hydrogen just comes along with the O, H2O, right? So the hydrogen comes for, for free. Of course, other elements are important. Phosphorus, you know, was important for DNA and ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So that's also important. I'm going to focus on the most abundant elements. Carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and of course hydrogen, again, comes along with water. So that's the human body. Well, what about our planet? Well, here's what our planet is made of. It's mostly oxygen, too. But that oxygen is tied up in silicates. Think sand. Think glass. So these are minerals that are mostly silicon, iron, magnesium, and it's bonded in a variety of ways with oxygen. That's not the stuff of life. Right? Life is the other, carbon, hydrogen, also oxygen, but in the form of water. So I want to focus on the latter, the, what the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen that's going to form life. But we have to, of course, have to have the planet, and so we need these silicates as well. And we can see that in space. In fact, the origin of our planet comes from tiny little, we call them dust grains. They're, again, mostly silicon in composition. Uh, and they're smaller than the width of a human hair. They're scattered throughout space. They get collect together, have a massive party, and that's what results in our planet. And along the way, we have to understand how these other elements get involved, the elements of life. All right, so I want to follow the main elements of life through the process of planet formation. And I actually know, based upon simple chemistry, where those elements will be found. So water, of course, is found in H2O. We, water, we know where that is, the oxygen carried by water. The carbon is in CO, CO2, and organics. And I'll show you how we know this. All right? So I can try and track these things. Now, the trick is they could be in different phases, right? So you could have an element in the gas or in the solid state. These elements are not in the rocks for the most part. They're in the either ices or the gas. The terrestrial world, like our own, is made of solids. So that points to the ices and not the gases. But it's easier for me and astronomers to detect things in the gaseous state. So if I want to study the composition writ large, we actually go to regions where, regions where we know the ices are evaporated, and I can study the entire composition all at once and then track the elements. So that's what we do. And you know, the outer context of this is that the gas giants here uh, are mostly made of gas. OK, this is uh, a schematic of planet formation. I could show you astronomical images, but this is actually really cool. I like this one because it shows the connective tissue between each of these. So we have clouds mostly of gas, uh, hydrogen. Molecular hydrogen is the main element in the, these clouds that make stars and eventually planets. Uh, and tiny particulate matter, we call that dust, right? And these clouds are rotating, and something goes along and causes it to collapse, all right? So it's rotating and collapsing. And what happens is when you have a rotating object and it collapses, so here I am, I'm going to swing this ball around my head and try not to hit anybody. And you can see that I can swing this very nicely. There, I feel the centrifugal force here. But I cannot, as much hard as I try, swing this directly above my head, right? It's unsupported. So what does that mean? You have a rotating body that is collapsing. All that stuff at the top here that's unsupported, boom, goes down and collapses. And so this rotating object collapses into a disk. 
all right? And the planets are born in that disk. This is why in the solar system, all the planets are actually in a disk, in a plane, a single plane, except for Pluto, which is why we kicked it out. One of the reasons why, and, and, and Pluto deserved it, okay? So there's no doubt about that. Okay, so we have a disk, the planets are born in that disk, and eventually the gas goes away and the dust makes planets and you have a planetary system or a solar system like our own. All right, so a bit of parlance here. I'm not really going to talk about this, but I wanted to provide a bit of scale because astronomy is kind of insane um, in many ways. One astronomical unit, that is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Right, and that's on the order of about 10 to the 11th kilometers, so it's pretty far. Uh, one parsec, we collapse this down instead of we, when we talk about distances to objects beyond our sun, we have to go to even greater distances. So we use what's called a parsec, so that's 200,000 AU, give or take, and about 10 to the 16 kilometers, okay? One light year is the distance traveled by light, and one year is a third of a parsec. Most, the nearest planet, star and planet forming regions to us are about 100 parsecs, or in this case, 300 light years away. The one I'm going to show you is the one in Orion. That one is 1,200 light years away. All right, temperature, when I talk about it, will be presented in Celsius. So zero degrees Celsius is when water freezes. We're very much aware of that. Uh, and 100 degrees Celsius is when water boils. All right, so I'm going to go look for molecules in space. How, 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 how could I do this? Well, all right, molecules don't sit still, OK? They have motions. All right, one motion is rotation. And they collide into each other, and when they're rotating, they gain energy from that collision. That actually causes them to rotate faster. And just like us, molecules like to be in the ground rotational state. You know, sitting on the couch, some popcorn, watching a movie, right? You know, just chill, right? So what it does is it relaxes down to that ground state, and what it does, it emits a photon of light that photon comes out in a very specific region of the spectrum of light. And I can take my telescope and I can almost like tune it uh, to the frequency where that water is emitting. And I can say, it, say, see the water from interstellar space saying, hey, here I am. I can measure that. I can see that it's there. I can measure the amount of water that's present as well. There are other motions that water can do as well. It can vibrate. It can do the funky chicken, do a whole bunch of stuff, all right? All of these are associated with energy, and we can tune our telescopes or point our telescopes and go to a specific part in the spectrum of light where water will emit and know that it's there. So here's the spectrum of light. You're very much familiar with this, maybe, if you've ever had an x-ray. You didn't see the x-rays, right? But, you know, something happened, right? Ultraviolet light. Here's what we're used to, visible light, right? And what is visible light? Visible light is where the sun produces and lets out most of its energy. It's not an accident that our eyes were formed, right, through evolution to be sensitive to where the, the, the sun is emitting most of its light, right? It's not an accident. So molecules emit most of their light here, actually in the submillimeter microwave and also in the infrared. And just to show you a little bit of this different type of light, uh, we have here an infrared camera. Uh, if I can get this off here. All right, well, we'll do it. Can you come take it off for me? All right, yeah, so it's really cool. So this was uh, my colleague John Monnier bought this. He's an infrared astronomer. So you can look at yourself. We are heat sources. Heat comes out in the infrared here. I'm going to point it at the, the door there. And you can see it's 21 Celsius. I'll point it now at my child. Uh, down here, you know, somewhere about 27, 30 degrees Celsius. So heat, right? And so, all right, so we use the full spectrum of light in astronomy. And in my case, uh, for the most part, I am confined to where molecules are doing their emission. And that is in the infrared, microwave, and submillimeter, and also the radio. So you can think of tuning your radio. I go to a telescope. Uh, such as this one here. This is the IRAM telescope in Spain. Uh, it's a 30 meter telescope. It's huge, good food. Uh, 
and I can detect molecules there. We're also building a telescope. This is the James Webb Space Telescope in a bay at, at Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, and you can see the gorgeous, beautiful, amazing 6.5 meter mirror of this telescope. When this launches, we hope in a couple years, and if it works, we hope, uh, it will be, it'll induce another revolution in planet formation. All right, so here we are. Let's look at molecules. This is the Orion constellation. It's up right now in the night sky. If I were going to look at this with carbon monoxide eyes, I would see this if I had. So this is the emission from carbon monoxide. Uh, this is not a small object, whatever this is. It's 100 light years in size, right? So you figure out those massively huge factors that I told you. This thing is big. It's mostly formed of molecules, mostly H2, with a little bit of other things. So it's molecules mixed with my silicate dust. We are, are very expressive creatures, astronomers. So this thing is big. It's a full of molecules. So it's a giant molecular cloud. It's descriptive. Um, this object, we could actually measure temperatures, which is so cool, uh, is only 10 to 20 degrees above absolute zero. It's cold. Uh, that's minus 260 degrees Celsius or 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, this actually makes sense. Uh, to, for, for an object to collapse, it has to, the resistive force is thermal pressure, right? The pressure of the gas. And if it's really, really cold, the pressure is less. So it makes sense the stars will be born in the coldest regions of space, in a way. So that's physics, right? Uh, and we can measure the amount of material. This contains enough material to make over 100,000 suns. OK, so here's a, a, a better picture of Orion, one of my favorite pictures. And you can look at this thing. You can see other things. This other stars here in the belt, uh, if I go to the top, Left here, you see there's a, a red object. That's a star that's on its way out. It's, a, it's what's called a red giant. It's puffed out its outer envelope, so it actually turns red its light. It's Betelgeuse. Um, but also, if I go down below the belt, I see this other object here, which looks a little bit more diffuse. It doesn't look like a star. That's because it's not. It's a stellar nursery. So here is a picture of this from the European Southern Observatory, one of their telescopes. And this is one of my favorite astronomical images because uh, it's so beautiful. Uh, and they did a really good color stretch on this. And so the, the red parts are stars that are still kind of being born. And all the stars you see in the image there, for the most part, are stars that have been born in the past million years or so. So they're baby stars. All right, for context, our sun is 4.6 billion years old, right? So these are really stellar nurseries in the making. They've just been born. And the stuff, the diffuse light you see around that, that's actually the, the material out of which the stars and planets are, are, are made out of. All right, so we have a stellar nursery here. I'm going to center in on this one, the big yellow dot sort of in the top middle there. And I'm going to point my radio telescope at that and look for water. This is what a spectrum is what we call it of water looks like. Uh, all that is is just telling me the water molecule telling me, say, hey, here I am. And I told you I could measure the amount. This is water vapor. Uh, if it were to condense into liquid form on a planet, that would be 10,000 oceans. OK? That's a lot of water associated with planet formation and star formation. So I can also point my telescope and look at a broad range of the spectrum where molecules are emitting. And that's what you're seeing here. This is the most comprehensive spectrum of uh, any astronomical object, star forming object that has been obtained, was obtained towards this object. Uh, this is a spectrum from the Herschel Space Observatory. Uh, and all those things going up there, there are different molecules that are emitting. So I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. Um, at 557 gigahertz, Right in the middle there, there's something coming up. That's, that's water. Uh, we actually, people go to the lab. They measure the frequencies and tell us where things are emitting. So that's, that's what we do. So it's a very uh, field that, that actually needs laboratory science, where they actually do physics and chemistry and all kinds of things tied together, very much interdisciplinary. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. And you see this interesting structure in the middle around 524 gigahertz. There's something going on there. That's methanol. All right, that's one molecule telling us it's there. Uh, and I can take this and 
take everything that we know about what molecules emit and classify them. And this was really hard, hard work. Uh, it required a graduate student to do it because, uh, you know, <laughs> that's what we do, right? All the hard stuff, but of course it's the joy of it all, or so we tell ourselves. I was a grad student once too, I remember. Uh, we th see things again like methanol, uh, ethanol, there's more alcohol in space than you can imagine. Uh, pit stop places, uh, there's methyl cyanide, that's CH3CN. All kinds of what, we, what I would call simple organic molecules. If you want to think about DNA, it's this really complex, many, many, many atoms in that one very complicated molecule. We are seeing in organics in space in the regions where stars and plants are born, very simple ones. Uh, but that's where a lot of the carbon is, and we also see water. And I can zoom in. Uh, what I'm doing is the same part of the spectrum, but going to lower levels, getting closer to the noise. And we're still detecting molecules even at those layers. And this student was Nathan Crockett. He he's, was wonderful and did a great job on this. So what have, what have we figured out? So I can detect molecules in space, and I can do this accounting now. All right? And I know where the silic silicon is. It's in this, these dust particles. All right? Uh, and again, sand, glass, whatever. Oxygen, 40% of the oxygen, give or take, is with the, with the rocks. And about 60% is a water ice coating on top of these pre-planetary dust grains. Okay? The carbon and nitrogen is trapped alongside the water in these small organics and in CO or CO2. But for the stuff that actually makes it to the Earth, it's coming in as organic form. So small organics that may be processed when the rocks get bigger. All right, so what do I mean by that? Well, I told you these things are the silicates, the pre-planetary materials. We now know they're coated in ices and organics. They're teeny tiny. They have to get together and bounce into each other and grow and grow and grow. And there may be other physical effects that foster that growth. But you go from really small sizes to millimeter sizes, to centimeter sizes, eventually you get the kilometer sizes, we call those planetesimals. And then you get big enough, you get what we call planetary embryos, that's about Mars size, and then they get together and make the Earth. And this process is a very violent one. Things are banging into each other all the time, which is why the lunar surface uh, has all this evidence of cratering. The Earth would also have similar evidence, because we were the biggest thing around the block. We were saying, hey, come hit me, right, please. Right? In fact, we would assist you because we were the biggest gravitational body around. Uh, but the evidence of the craters of formation have been erased because we have a living planet. All right, so that's how you make planet formation. And I just told you, hey, all the planets are born with lots of ices and organics. So I got my carbon, I got my oxygen, and we have our water world. Actually, no. We have a tiny amount of water on this planet. So this is just showing if I took all the water that we have on the Earth and compare it to the rocks, we have very little water. It's below a percent by mass in H2O. We are a water poor world. All right, well, we're a living planet. All this carbon-based life form on the surface. Let me take all that carbon away and ask how much is there. nothing. We are a carbon poor planet. If you look at the material that was available at the distance where the Earth was born, all the elements, if I did an accounting, I would find that we got less than one carbon atom per 10,000 that was available. And nitrogen is even worse. One nitrogen atom per 100,000 available. Ah! Right? Oh my gosh. So we are a silicate rock with a tiny sprinkling of carbon and nitrogen and some water. But we're here, right? Hmm, what does that mean? Well, let's think a little bit more about that. All right, so how did this come about? There should be plenty of this stuff. We should be a carbon-rich world. We're not. We should be a water-rich world. We're not. Well, we think it has something to do with what we call the ice line in the forming solar system. 
If you get closer to the star, there's more energy, the materials would be hotter, right? And as you go further away, it would get colder. So there has to be some point where there's a transition. In this case, the transition isn't going from vapor to liquid to solid. The pressures are too low. It goes from vapor directly to solid. So we call this the snow line in the disk. We think the Earth was born inside the snow line. That is, we were born with very little water, and since the organics and the carbon came with the water, very little carbon as well. So that's what this schematic shows you. The dotted line shows you the putative ice line. Jupiter formed beyond the ice line, and the terrestrial planets formed inside the ice line. So how then did we get what water we have and what carbon we have? Well, it's not clear exactly the precise way, but we have a very good idea of how it must have happened. And so you have these planetesimals or planetary amblies orbiting around. And every once in a while, one of them is going to get close enough to the other one, as shown in the bottom left here. Uh, and they'll have a gravitational interaction. And what that'll do is it'll change the orbit of one of them, the smaller one for the most part. And it'll make it you know, more eccentric. Okay. And so it'll go to different places in the solar system than it otherwise would. And then it might hit something and cause whatever object it hits to grow. In addition to changing the eccentricity, if I were to take this and flip it on its side, it will also change its inclination. Okay? So here is one simulation of how you might make terrestrial planets. So a bunch of different rocks, they're color coded with distance, and they're starting at about 10 to the minus 5. Earth masses. And I'm going to let this simulation go. And as time goes on, you see that bigger things are growing. Not much is moving around. But eventually, when you start to get big things, all of a sudden, you start seeing higher eccentricities and higher inclinations. Right? That means there's more gravitational interactions going on. And that allows for growth to occur. OK. Well, that's this simulation. This is a quiescent simulation. And this is by, I believe, Clark et al. It's a really nice paper. We have a giant planet in our solar system, Jupiter. We also have Saturn, uh, Uranus, Neptune. But Jupiter is the one we care about for the Earth. Uh, and whatever Jupiter does actually will dictate the outcome for how things move around. And there's one model out there that suggests Jupiter could move in and move out due to its mutual gravitational interaction with Saturn. And when it does that, it can really change what happens in the terrestrial planet forming zone where the Earth is being born. That's one model. There's others. But it's illustrative of what the effects are. So here we are, same simulation. I have Jupiter here. okay, And they're color coded now. These are water rich in blue and water poor in red or orange. And I'm going to let this go. And you see Jupiter's there. A lot more gravitational interactions are occurring right from the get-go. And that makes sense, because Jupiter's so big. OK? So things are growing. And eventually, Jupiter's going to move. And just craziness occurs, right? Uh, and you start mixing things up. And now, if you look at 1 AU, where the Earth is going to be born, you see more blue material or green material. And the Earth, which started out red, is now a little bit yellowish. All right? So what that is, it's supply of material from beyond the ice line to the young forming planet. And the exact way it happens, we don't know. Uh, because it really depends upon what Jupiter, where Jupiter was born. And we know planets can move now uh, and what it did. OK, so if we look out there right now, about on the order of 5%, maybe 10% of systems have a Jupiter at the distance where our Jupiter is. Uh, most other systems don't have a Jupiter at that distance. OK, it's about 5-ish AU. All right. And we know that these things can move as they're being born because they're actually interacting with the, the, the disk out of which the planets are being born out of. So what this means is there must be variable supply. There must be some worlds that have more carbon 
perhaps some that have less. Since we have such a tiny amount, you would think it'd be more likely that planets would have much more carbon and also much more water. So what does that mean for life? It's a good question. We have to think about that. So for that, we have to head to the other parts. We have to form a planet in the right place. But what do I mean by that? This one actually is kind of simple. It's what we call the Goldilocks zone, or the habitable zone. So if I take a planet, and if I'm too close to star, it's too hot. My oceans don't go in a liquid form. They're in the gaseous state. All the water's in the atmosphere. That's bad for life, right? Life needs a liquid. OK. Then you get to the right distance, the Goldilocks zone. That you can have liquid on the surface, and it can exist freely. And of course, if you go further out, uh, it will be ice. Today in astronomy, when we are looking and finding for planets, if we can determine that it's a rocky world, we're asking, is it in the habitable zone around its star? We are assuming that water is present. We are assuming that carbon is present. We don't know. And that's just the state of where we are today. But the habitable zone is still the key context, right? The other is it has to have a stable climate. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, here's our wonderful, beautiful solar system with all the wonderful planets. I want to focus on just three of them, Mars, the Earth, and Venus, and particularly the Earth and Venus. They're, the, they're sisters, brothers, the same size. We're basically the same planet. Venus is 400 plus degrees Fahrenheit. It has acid raining from the sky. It's not really a nice place. All right? We, for the most part, are living on a nice planet. Yeah, at times, right? But so how, how, how did this come to be? What we know is that it's likely, you know, Venus and the Earth were formed pretty close. We should have received about the same amount of carbon and water. There's no doubt that Venus had this material on it. Why are we so different? And the answer is part because Venus is closer to the sun, yes, but it's not all that. And we have to talk about that. All right, and that comes down to understanding how a living planet works. Uh, and one of the most important things for a living planet is the greenhouse effect. It has an atmosphere. All right, and it's how the planet's surface is warmer than it otherwise would be. You actually know of this term within another context today. We call it climate change. All right. And the greenhouse effect is how climate change is happening. All right? It's just what a planet does. All right? If you have a planet with an atmosphere, it traps heat. So how does that work? Well, we have visible sunlight that passes through the atmosphere, and it hits the surface. You go to the beach, the sand is hot. You walk on blacktop with your coat, with your feet. It's hot, right? The surface is being heated up. OK? Well. Where does heat get re-emitted? Well, just saw the infrared camera, didn't we? Right? It comes out in the infrared. All right? That infrared light from the surface gets pushed out, sent out into space. OK? Well, we have molecules in our atmosphere. Some molecules have modes, vibrational modes, that are in the infrared. And some don't. So some molecules absorb that heat trap it on the surface, and the planet gets warmer than it otherwise would. OK, so the molecules that have these modes, vibrational modes, are things like water. I showed you the vibrational modes of water, CO2 and methane. Molecules such as N2 and O2. N2, of course, is the main constituent of our atmosphere. O2, the other main constituent of our atmosphere. They are what we call homonuclear. They don't have any asymmetries. So that's why they don't have as many vibrational modes. Okay? So the ones that do the damage are trace species in our atmosphere, minor constituents, CO2, methane, and water. We need this. We need the greenhouse effect. Okay? We just don't need too much of it. And we could talk about climate change later if you want. Uh, so this is higher, the temperature would be higher than if we didn't have an atmosphere. So this is a comparison between Venus, Earth, and Mars. So the average temperature of the Earth in Celsius is typically about 15 degrees Celsius. If we didn't have our atmosphere, we would be minus 18 degrees Celsius. 
we would be a floating ice rock, tiny amount of ice, rock in space. No life. The atmosphere is crucial, crucial to us being there. Mars, average surface temperature is minus 50, 47 degrees Celsius. It's no greenhouse temperatures, minus 57. You notice that the change in the Earth is bigger than it is for Mars. That's because Mars has a more tenuous atmosphere. Venus is crazy. It has a huge atmosphere compared to the Earth, mostly CO2, big greenhouse gas. So its average surface temperature is well above the boiling point of water. Okay. Now you notice that the no greenhouse temperature of Venus is, is lower than the no greenhouse temperature of the Earth. That's because Venus surface in this particular model was assumed to be more reflective of light. But regardless, Venus is a hellish place. The Earth, some places are paradise, although it's all in the eye of the beholder, right? So the Earth in carbon. Why are Venus and the Earth so different? We should have had the same amount of carbon. All of Venus's carbon is in its atmosphere. But well, where is the Earth's carbon? It's not actually in its atmosphere. Well, today, if we had all the carbon that was in the Earth's mantle in the atmosphere, we would be Venus too. We're not. Why? Well, 60 times more carbon and CO2 is in the oceans than is in the atmosphere. 3,000 times that was in the ocean is locked up in rocks. So where is the Earth's carbon? It's in rocks. Okay, And this actually is set up by two factors. The fact that we have liquid oceans. So the CO2 in the atmosphere dissolves into the ocean. And in the oceans, it reacts with other things. Right now, it's actually forming uh, the shells of uh, uh, living sea creatures. And when those sea creatures die, that carbonate, uh, that carbon-bearing shells, whatever, rocks, gets, goes to the ocean floor. And through plate tectonics, it gets pushed deeper under the Earth's mantle, where that carbon eventually may be re-released via volcanoes in the form of CO2. So then the cycle begins again. That CO2 dissolves into the ocean, becomes a rock, goes down the thing, goes down the bottom, and then it gets pushed by plate tectonics deeper down, and so we go. It's this cycle, a living planet, that leads for us to have this nice habitable world. So what is plate tectonics? Just a brief plate tectonics, very brief, 101. Uh, the Earth's surface the, is slightly rigid. It's called the lithosphere. It's broken up into different plates. Uh, we're on one of the plates. And in the mid-ocean ridge between South America and the African plate, the North American plate, and the Eurasian plate, there's a line going up right through the middle of that graph. The ocean floor is splitting apart a little bit. All right, and that's pushing, in this case, say, the North American plate against the Pacific plate. And that leads to the, one of the plates being pushed under the other one. Okay, that's called subduction. So that's part of this recycling. And, we are intimately familiar with this. We know that California has things like the San Andreas Fault, right? That's all due to this interaction. And it's the Earth moving heat around, the heat from the interior, that leads to this. And I have this really cool movie that I found uh, about this process. So you have the center of the Earth releasing heat. It leads to what we call convection cells, where the hot rock, in this case, actually moves upward and then it cycles back down and cools down, and you get these huge cells. And what's happening is you can see the two cells are interaction, interacting with each other, pushing, that's the mid-Atlantic mid ridge part, part apart, and then you can see the other part where the convection cell is going down, that's leading to subduction and pushing material back in again. So, a living planet. We need this to happen for us to lock all the carbon in the rocks and not have it in the atmosphere. Okay? So, what does this mean? Well, Venus, we can explain Venus now. It's too close to the sun. Its oceans were lost, broke the CO2 cycle. 
Any CO2 that gets outcast by the volcanoes as Venus is evolving stays in the atmosphere. Leads to a thick atmosphere of a greenhouse gas and it's all over for life on Venus. All right. Mars is a little bit different. It's a smaller planet. It lost its heat a little bit quicker, so it's geologically dead. And so it's an ice ball floating in space. Now, let's think about this more broadly. We're finding other Earths right now. Clearly, the distance to the star has to matter, right? The Goldilocks zone has to happen. But you could have a planet in the Goldilocks zone with too much carbon on it, perhaps. Right? What if I took an Earth and I put 10 times more carbon on it, just through the randomness of birth? I don't have a clue, I'm not a geophysicist, whether plate tectonics could take that carbon and stuff it in the mantle so that we turn into an Earth and not a Venus. In fact, it's probably likely that it couldn't. It's got 100 times more carbon. Right? And so that really points to me that you know, when we go through this search for life elsewhere, Venus may be more common than an Earth. And so the search for life may get harder in that sense. Do we know the answer to this? We don't. So how are we going to determine that? Well, are we alone? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the spectrum of these planets. All right? So this is uh, two different spectra in different wavelength regimes here. So the bottom one is the, what we call the mid-infrared. Uh, and the top one is the visible. Let's look at the, the bottom one here. In the center there, if we look at the blue line, that's the Earth, the spectrum of the Earth, the solid blue line. So I see a bunch of different features in there. There's a feature of methane. There's a feature of water. There's a feature of ozone. That's coming from O2. All right. There's CO2, N2O, and water. If I look at Venus, that's the sort of goldish, yellowish line. You don't see ozone, no O2. You don't see water. Same with Mars. OK? So there's a distinction here. What's this distinction? Well, well we have water. We, we know. We need that. So this is how we're going to tell if other planets have water. We're going to take their spectrum and look for water. O2 is the only molecule, well, it's not true. O2 is a key molecule that is created by life on our planet. O2, molecular oxygen, was not provided when the planet is born. It's when life at some time, about three something billion years ago, figured out photosynthesis. And photosynthesis, actually, from an evolutionary standpoint, makes sense. If you can harness the energy from the sun, it's the biggest energy source out there. And it will solve your problem. Okay? And so at its heart, photosynthesis is the key step towards life. It gets the energy from the sun, and off it goes. And one of the byproducts of photosynthesis is putting O2 into our atmosphere. And we can actually track that in time, because we can see when oxygen shows up in the atmosphere, it actually causes rust. It takes iron and it oxidizes it. And we can look for basically rusted rocks and track when oxygen first showed up on our planet. So oxygen is key. Another molecule that life creates is methane. So you can think of cows in the field eating some hay and then releasing some pungent gases. Uh, some of those pungent gases are methane. Okay, so O2 and methane are molecules of life. In addition, they are highly reactive to each other. The only way they can exist in our atmosphere is if they're constantly being produced. Okay, it's what's called chemistry and disequilibrium. That's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking for O2 and methane. And when we find it, we're going to run to the New York Times <laughs> and everything else. I guarantee that. All right, so it's a little problem, though, because the stars are brighter than the planet. And because of optics and the atmosphere, it gets very hard to detect the planet and take that spectrum uh, because the planet is too close to the star. And so I have an example here in this demo. Uh, 
So the little light in front here is the planet. And now I'm going to turn on the star, maybe. Sorry. I can't see the planet no more, right? All right, so that's a problem. OK, another example to this is the star is a billion times brighter than the planet. So here's a lighthouse. Well, not anymore. And there's a firefly right next to it. I can't tell that firefly is there. OK, so the firefly is hidden in the glare. All right, now, so what we have to do is we have to take that firefly near the lighthouse, only the lighthouse is in California, and I'm in Philadelphia. That sounds hard, right? <laughs> but that's what we can do, or we're going to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to build the biggest telescopes the world has ever seen, the biggest telescope in the history of humanity, which is cool. Uh, one of these will be the extremely large telescope uh, built in Chile by the European Southern Observatory. And we at Michigan are negotiating to try and get uh, access, slight access to this facility, which is very exciting for us. Uh, there is the ones being built by the United States, uh, by right now by private consortiums and hopefully soon by uh, sponsored by the National Science Foundation, we hope. And that's the Giant Magellan Telescope in Chile. That'll be on the order of 23 meters. And there's one being built in California called the 30 meter telescope. With these telescopes, uh, your Michigan astronomers, all three of them, we hope to get access to. And we will be trying, I will be trying, to see if we're alone in the universe. There's also a neat little thing that NASA's going to eventually try. It's still in the development stage. It's something called the star shade. And what I'm showing you is this star shade here. Uh, it's a way to change the, optical, the optics of the system. So it's going to try with this thing. You take the telescope and this gigantic flower-shaped thing, and you use the flower-shaped thing to block the light from the, the star to reveal the planets around it. It's really insanely cool. <laughs> Uh, and again, it's in the development stage, and maybe uh, we'll build it. It will be built sometime in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, and along with the big telescopes uh, will be one of the ways we will be trying to find if we are alone in the universe. So um, I'll leave you with this quote. Uh, Two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not. And both are equally terrifying. Thank you so much. <laughs>